and in 55 other countries around the globe. The Hinckley Institute also offers classes, the nation's only campaign management minor, week-long experiences to Washington, D.C., and over $700,000 worth of academic scholarships. We invite students to go next door or to our website, www.hinckley.utah.edu, for more information. The title of today's forum is Things I Have Learned About Energy, Politics, Policy, and Opportunity. Our guest today is Dr. Lauren Nelson, Executive Director of the Office of Energy Development for the State of Utah. Dr. Lauren Nelson was appointed by the Governor's Energy Advisor to be the Director of the Utah Office of Energy Development in 2014. Prior to her appointment, Dr. Nelson served as the Vice President of Government and Regulatory Affairs for Potash Ridge Corp., the Vice President of Energy and Environmental Development at Redleaf Resources, and as the Energy Advisor to Utah Governor John M. Huntsman. She also served as the Energy Policy Advisor to the Idaho Public Utilities Commission and a technical consultant to the Utah Division of Public Utilities. Dr. Nelson's past board and committee appointments include serving as the Utah representative to the Western Renewable Energy Generation Information System, the Idaho representative to the Western Interstate Energy Board, and the Utah representative on the Federal Unconventional Resources Task Force, and the chair of the Salt Lake Chamber of Energy and Minerals Task Force. Dr. Nelson has been proactive in defining and supporting balanced and sustainable energy solutions, including providing congressional testimony, participating in regional collaborations, working with counties and cities, and coordinating across diverse stakeholders. Dr. Nelson has over 20 years of experience working on energy and natural resource issues in both the public and private sectors. She has a solid track record of working collaboratively to deliver positive policy, regulatory, and commercial results. Dr. Nelson holds a PhD in economics from the University of Utah and resides with her family in Salt Lake City. She enjoys running, skiing, and art. Through her involvement in the Salt Lake City Junior League, she is actively engaged in supporting community initiatives to enhance the welfare of low-income families. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guest, Dr. Laura Nelson. Thank you, Tyler. I really appreciate that long and lengthy introduction and apologize that somehow you didn't get the abbreviated version of my bio. <laughs> um, but it's just a tremendous uh, opportunity to be here today. And I want to give a special thanks to Jason Perry, uh, who I had the great opportunity to work with when I was uh, working with Governor Huntsman and over the years and has been a, a, a great friend and support and understands the key issues around energy for our state. And I also want to thank all of you uh, who are here today. Um, this is a great, I think, indication of your recognition and the Institute's recognition and understanding of the importance of energy and energy related issues, not just to our state, but really to our region and to the nation. Um, I want to go to a famous speech that you all may have heard. It was a graduation speech that was given by uh, David Foster Wallace, arguably one of the greatest authors of our time who passed away in 2008, far too early. But he gave some remarks to some students getting ready to set off in the world. And um, he starts his story with uh, two fish who are approached by a man who leans in and he says, so boys, how's the water today? The guppies, they look at each other, very confused. And they kind of shrug, I guess, as guppies can shrug. Wiggle, I suppose. And they say, what water? They didn't recognize that the water surrounded them, that in fact it was the thing that allowed them to exist, and that without it, they wouldn't be there. So I think that energy is like this. It's like the guppy's view on water. Now there are many things, certainly there are many things that contribute to our existence, but certainly energy, its availability, its affordability, its reliability, allows us to do many things that we might not otherwise be able to do. It is a key factor in our ability to change our environment. In fact, we do change our environment to meet our needs for existence. It's the reason we're warm in the winter, and it's the reason that we're cool in the summer. However, there are a number of political, maybe social, and economic considerations as we look at the energy ecosystem. And I use that term ecosystem very deliberately because 
it truly is uh, an ecosystem. Similar to biological systems, energy is produced and it's shared in a symbiotic way. And that symbiosis improves our lives and it improves our communities. It doesn't occur in a vacuum. And production and consumption of energy does in fact power our lives. The biological energy interactions have an important bearing on the structure of organisms, ecosystems, and over geologic time and of the planet itself. Doesn't that sound a lot like the things we hear when we talk about energy and our consumption and production of energy? But maybe one thing that's a little bit different for us as humans is that we have choice in how we use energy, how we produce energy, how we harness, in fact, the different types of energy to meet our needs, to meet our wants, in fact. But how do we make perfect choices? How do we make those choices? Is there really such a thing as a 2020 vision when it comes to energy? We all want it to be affordable. We all want it to be reliable. We all want it to be stable. And energy and environment are very much intertwined in this conversation. But when we're looking at transportation, heating our homes, and allowing for economic growth, energy is always part of the equation. So we often try to identify the resources that we prefer rather than looking at necessarily the goals or the outcomes. We make choices about what we want today in terms of our resources for energy based on the information that we have today, or at least that we think we have uh, today. And so given this, given that choices in the energy space are interesting and they're challenging and they impact so many aspects of our life. I felt that I wanted to talk to you today about the things that I have learned about energy. I'm going to attempt to avoid um, subjective interpretation. I'll leave that up to you. Um, but certainly it'll be the things that I think that I've, I've learned and, and hopefully you'll learn something too. I have to give some credit to Clayton Christensen who I had the great honor to hear speak uh, about a year ago at Zions Bank. And he gave a speech that he had given for the first time called, The Things I've Learned About Thinking. The four things, in fact. So I'm gonna tell you four things I've learned about energy. So the first thing that I've learned about energy, and maybe you've already gathered it, is that energy is complicated. And it is certainly, certainly more difficult than I ever thought it would be. So I've already mentioned that it's important to the quality of life that we enjoy, and I think that most of us understand that. At some level, we certainly understand it. But we're generally largely unaware of it. Uh, we don't pay that much attention to it. And so we're not often thinking about how it's produced, how it's delivered, how it's regulated. How did, how did it get here? Why are the lights on in here? We don't really think about it. So I'm gonna talk, first of all, about something that may be a little controversial. Coal, let's talk about coal. Coal has served for many years as a primary source of low cost, reliable energy in the United States. And it's now proving to provide the same opportunity for developing countries that want to realize a similar quality of life as we've experienced here in the US. However, some people think, why do they have to go there? Why do they have to go to coal? Can they skip a step? Can they go to some other alternative? Well, maybe, maybe they can go directly to another resource option. But I'm gonna tell you it's probably not likely to be that simple because energy choices and energy systems are not simple. We make our choices about energy based on cost and we also look at what we consider to be clean. And we believe that these decisions are fairly straightforward or at least we attempt to boil them down to something that we can easily relate to. But what happens today what happens today and the choices that we make today, in fact, are based on policy decisions that we made long ago in the past, on economic data and assumptions that we had about the cost of those decisions, regardless of the decision, whether it was about energy or economic growth or where we wanted to go as a country. Moreover, those decisions have often been made in order to provide us a better quality of life. Uh, and in the energy space, they were made to provide us energy for some period of time, often years or decades. And this has been the case for electric resource planning. So I'm going to take a little advice from Samuel Clemens, and I'm going to turn to something that I actually know a little more about 
And that, in fact, is the power space, the electric generation space, the electricity space. In the electricity space, we have relied on some key planning and policy tools to assure that energy can be made available in our homes and our businesses for use at reasonable rates on a reliable basis and safely. Starting with planning, utilities for years have engaged in a process of integrated resource planning, looking at all of the resource options and how they're going to get it to your home. In Utah and also in other parts of the country, planning has centered around the use of coal. It's been abundant, it's been inexpensive, and it's been available. So policies, in fact, even emerged to push us towards using domestic local resources. In 1973, some of you, maybe not looking around, many of you, remember that in 1973, the United States was in crisis because of an oil embargo by the Arab nations. We couldn't get it. We had gasoline lines. It was very concerning to us because it threatened our very way of life. So we pushed to use more local resources, to use more local fuel options, and coal was a part of that. Eventually, we built more energy efficiency into our plans. Uh, you may have heard about Jimmy Carter wearing a sweater in the White House, really starting that message about conservation, which is not the same as energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is about how we consume energy in a way that keeps us as comfortable, but where we use less of it. And we began to focus on those efficiencies, not just in our consumption, but also in our power plants, looking for improved operations that would maximize our output and lower cost, and at the same time, have a reduced environmental impact. In other words, there would be less impact per unit of energy produced. Then natural gas came on. Natural gas became fairly inexpensive. And we saw that as an abundant available resource, similar to the way that we saw coal. And don't forget, or if you've never heard it, that there was a time that this country thought that we were certain to run out of natural gas. But as it became cheaper and abundant, we began to integrate it into our options and looking at that to meet our long-term consumption needs. Today, where are we with renewable resources? Solar and wind have become more technologically advanced and more cost competitive, key, more cost competitive. And so we've seen new opportunities develop across the renewable space, including geothermal resources. So all of these resources can be important, part of our mix in meeting our electric demand. But what's key is planning and the imperative for integrating these resources in a way that provides stability to the system and manages cost. Because again, those things are important to us. Different resources have different costs, but they also interface with what we call the electric grid in different ways. So when we diversify the resource mix, we have to consider what other changes are going to have to be made to a system that was actually built originally to provide a stable source of energy from energy supplies called baseload facilities, like coal, could be nuclear, or even large hydro systems up in the Pacific Northwest. And as we integrate new resources, what are going to be the changes on that system that was built for a specific purpose? Renewable resources, like solar and wind, have a unique characteristic. They're not always available. They're what we call intermittent. So when they're not available, we have to identify how are we going to meet our energy needs. We don't just want our energy to be available when those fuels are available. So back to my skipping step, this is likely one of the reasons that skipping a step will not be easy. We have to consider how operations will change. So in short, we have to plan, we have to be consistent in that planning, because when we have disparate planning, we have real consequences to our system. We have voltage disruptions, and these can lead to brownouts and blackouts, and that's generally something that people don't appreciate, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I've talked a little bit about cost, and I've talked about some of the resources that we've used, but I want to talk about something that sometimes is even more complex, and that's the policy, the regulation. Um, I mentioned that the power that comes into our homes often comes from large systems, uh, large expensive systems. And there was a decision made some time ago that in fact those large systems would operate more efficiently and all of this could be planned better if it was run by a single entity, at least covering large geographic areas. Well, the problem is that if you give that much control to a single entity, you can create something called monopoly power. And under monopoly situations, you can get a, a challenge where prices 
reflect what we would consider to be unfair rents. In other words, you would be paying costs that are well above the cost of the system. That is, if they're not properly regulated. So avoiding this meant that we had to create a regulatory system that protected consumers but allowed for those investments to be made. So we created something called the Regulatory Compact in most states. And that regulatory compact gave a single entity the right and the obligation to provide power or service to customers at rates that were based on reasonable recovery of cost, which included a reasonable and, yes, a guaranteed return on that investment. And it was viewed that that had to be the case in order to attract investment. But today, the regulatory compact isn't necessarily the norm. We have moved to an era that's been called an era of deregulation in many parts of the United States, in a period where people want to have more local control over their resource options. We consider this to be a matter of choice. We want choices about the resources that we use to get our energy. And this, in fact, has led to something you may have heard of, the residential solar boom, where you see lots of solar panels on people's homes. And we, in fact, have attributed certain moral values uh, to acquiring these new resources. We think of different resources as being good or clean, and those are often used synonymously, or some as being bad or dirty. And so we see a changing social dynamic when it comes to how energy, in this case electricity, is provided to our homes to meet our needs in different changing social desires. And those have emerged in federal policy. Uh, for example, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency just released something you may have heard about called the Clean Power Plan. And the purpose of the Clean Power Plan is to, in fact, regulate the amount of greenhouse gases or CO2 coming from our power plants or from our electric system. So I don't want to delve into the moral arguments of this at all. That's not my intent. But it's just meant to state that these changes will have impacts on planning. They will have impacts on cost. And they will impact how we develop and use resources. For example, California today has a glut, we'll call it a glut of solar, uh, because they put so much solar on their homes. I'm not saying, again, that this is necessarily a bad thing. But it's difficult currently to capture the value of that resource. And it also causes operational challenges. The good news is, and this is one of the things I've learned, there's always a solution. The solution is that we have to look at new ways of planning. We have to look at new ways that we can store energy, how we can move it around more effectively, and how we can construct markets to allow for efficient trades. Now, I'm not going to try to address all of those things here because that's probably all a whole lecture uh, in and of itself, but simply to highlight the complexity of our energy system, and in this case, the power system. And any decisions that we make in the power system, just to give you an additional note of how complex this is, usually have to be looked over by multiple agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, regional agencies, public service commissions called PSCs, regional planning and operating coordinators, NWPCC, which is the Northwest Power Conservation Council, WEC, NERC, FERC. I won't define them all for you. Maybe you can go look them up. But just the number of acronyms alone, hopefully, should guide you to the understanding that, in fact, energy is complex. So moving on, the second thing that I've learned about energy is that historically production has usually been remote. It's usually been remote from where we use it. We don't see it necessarily. Um, at least that's been the case, I would expect, in most of your lifetimes, in your parents' lifetimes, likely in your grandparents' lifetimes. And so I'm sure that you have gathered that energy has to be generated, it has to be refined, it has to be processed, and it has to be delivered to end users. It comes through wires, it comes through pipelines, trucks, rails. Often it comes thousands of miles away in order to meet our consumptive usage. It doesn't matter if it's coal, it doesn't matter if it's natural gas, large hydro, even large solar systems. We need space and we need access to the resource to develop sizable plants to realize economies of scale. That has been the norm. Um, and this remoteness has really served us well. Uh, because we've been able to realize these economies of scale. It's taken us a long way from where we were at the end of the 19th century when Edison built his Pearl Station in New York. And that served a total, I believe, I think my numbers are correct, 82 lamps and about 400 customers. And then this changed. 
and we looked at distances. We could build bigger plants and we could provide that power to more homes, to more lamps over longer distances. And this became about because of the vision and tenacity of Nikola Tesla, not Tesla the car, okay? Tesla the company, but of an individual. And also from a company, Westinghouse, who developed the induction high capacity motor system along with making significant advancements in moving energy by recognizing the operational value of alternating current. AC supply systems, which led to long distance high voltage transmission that allows us to have affordable energy today. So I've just given electricity as an example of remoteness, but it isn't the exception. Oil and gas operations are often also remote. And in fact, when they start to come up near where we live, we don't like it. We feel really uncomfortable. So we, we know it's remote. We don't think about it often because it's remote, and we're uncomfortable when it gets close to us. And this really just gets back to my whole message and my first point, is that it's complicated. And in fact, because it's complicated and it's remote, it concerns us. It concerns us a lot. You hear many debates about energy. Keystone Pipeline, for example. You don't have to raise your hand, but perhaps you've heard about it. Hydraulic fracturing, often called fracking. Coal-fired power plants. Um, Somebody has said recently to me that we don't ever say the word coal anymore without putting a qualifier in front of it, namely the word dirty. So coal-fired power plants, transmission lines. I could talk about all of these, but I'm going to just talk about a couple of them really quickly. Hydraulic fracturing, called fracking. It's a pretty well-known process. It's been used in Utah for close to 40 years, and it allows for the release of natural gas and oil that would otherwise not be available. It's a technology that can be combined with other technological advances, in particular something called horizontal drilling. So you don't have to drill straight down anymore, okay? You can drill horizontally. And what this allows you to do is to collect deep, somewhat segregated resources, pull them together in a way that minimizes, actually minimizes surface disturbance and lowers production cost. But the, free, the, the fracking revolution, I should also make this point, has liberated so much oil and gas in the last few years that it has nearly moved the United States towards energy independence. In fact, the Energy Information Administration says that by 2017, the United States will be a net exporter of natural gas. The problem is fracking is complicated, and it often occurs in places that we don't see because energy is remote. And you know what? It sounds scary, and it sounds maybe even ugly, fracking. Doesn't really sound like a particularly pretty word. Um, so much debate has emerged over the use of the technology and the consequences of the use of te that technology, and it's created fear. And the fear has been captured in movies. It's been captured on the cover of Time Magazine and innumerable social posts and blogs. I didn't even attempt to count them. And there's an appeal there, and it's a very emotional appeal in the message. Uh, for example, fracking will contaminate groundwater. That's scary, and fear is a real emotion. And this is very mesmerizing, and it's more mesmerizing than the technical details. So someone coming in with a technical argument would say something like this. Well development is a scary, complex, and costly process with five major steps. Well planning, well design, drilling operations, formation evaluation and testing, and well completion. And then it would go on from there to talk about the cost of drilling a well, that it's about $4 million for a natural gas well, about $3.9 million for an oil well, and in fact, that the cost of drilling have increased about 1,000% in the last 40 years. Well, those things really don't sound very provocative, but the message is that well development activities and the costs that are incurred are really done to ensure that drilling operations are implemented in a way that is environmentally responsible. And we certainly all want that. The challenge is that that doesn't sound really very provocative. That technical argument isn't particularly provocative. And I, I'm willing to take a bet, if anybody wants to make a bet with me today, that that will not become a box office hit. So now to transmission. I mentioned I talk a little bit about that. Because energy is remote, we do need to move it around. And transmission in our electric system is the way that we do that. And I've also mentioned that 
a lot of new local opportunities have emerged and people want that because they want choice. And a primary local choice has been solar and that this can impact, in fact, the operation of our energy system. So we're, we're replacing some remoteness with more local control, local solar. And I mentioned that there could be impacts of this. Again, there is a solution. We can look for balancing that resource with other resources that are available at different times. So fuel diversity is really key. Another fuel, which would actually be a great balance to the solar, is wind. But the big wind resources are predominantly located far away from this localized solar. So you have a situation where you do not have this large abundant resource, wind, co-located with localized solar. So what do we do? Well, we can build transmission lines. We can build transmission lines to do this. But building transmission lines is not without debate either. We worry about the placement of lines, whether they're going to be above ground, they're going to be below ground. There's concern, I, I will say unproven, just so you know, electromagnetic field impacts. You may have heard about that. Um, and we worry about the impact on species. And those could be real impacts on sage grouse, on birds of prey, the bald eagle. So we resist, and we have regulatory processes. We have policies that emerge to manage these impacts. And we view this generally as a positive thing. We have the National Energy Policy Act, which helps to guide much of this development across what we consider public lands in the development. But the challenge is that because of this policy, the time frames for developing resources are often extended. Um, it tends to result in some litigiousness and in fact can increase the cost of these solutions. But continually providing power to consumers and assuring that grid operations are optimized likely implies that we will continually need to bring energy from remote locations and that we will have transmission expansion along with other innovations like battery storage, you may be hearing about that lately, and that this is gonna be required to keep our energy highway both clean and efficient. So why is this the case? Why do I think I've learned this is the case? It's because of the third thing I've learned about energy, which is that people expect energy to be available. If you sit here for a minute and you think about what the most important thing is that you do when you come home, especially right now as we've, we've moved to standard time, I don't know about you, but when I get home, often at about seven or eight o'clock at night, it's dark. And the very first thing that I bet you do, and I know I do, when I walk in the house, is I turn on the lights. I wanna be able to see, and I can't see in the dark, at least not yet. When we go to the gas station, we expect fuel to be available for our cars. I mentioned the 1973 Arab oil embargo. Long, long lines. You may not remember this, maybe your grandparents for some of you, or parents for others. But I do, I remember sitting in the car with my parents in a long line waiting for gas. And the frustration and the fear that it wouldn't be available because we wouldn't be able to live our lives. We wouldn't be able to have the fuel to transport and get ourselves to work. And I remind myself of this when I go to the gas station and I often have this feeling like I really don't like putting gas in my car. I really don't like stopping and having to fuel my vehicle. You know the other thing I don't like? I don't really like paying my electric bill when it comes at the end of the month. I also don't like paying my gas bill <laughs> when it comes at the end of the month. But I think back to that long gas line and I recognize that energy is a privilege and it requires a little bit of an attitude adjustment on my part to recognize in fact that it is a privilege whether I'm getting gas or I'm paying one of my other bills. And so I have in my hands I think tools that can allow me to use my energy better. But then back to this complicated thing. I mentioned that, right? We use energy in lighting our homes, in home management systems, in if we're a business and let's say we've got our own on-site generation, it may not work all the time, let's use hospitals as an example. Would you like it if the lights went out at the hospital? No. So hospitals have something called backup power. They have to make sure it's there. Data centers, similarly, silicon chip manufacturers all need power, energy all the time. 
We also are looking at growth. You probably heard that Utah's population is set to increase significantly, in fact, double in the next 25 years. In fact, we will reach our next millionth person, be it four million people, in 16 years. And growth, in fact, impacts our energy use. I'll give you a fun little example of how growth and policy decisions can impact energy use. I don't know the numbers, but I did read an article recently that Colorado is having a little bit of a challenge with their energy use because they've legalized marijuana. Well, marijuana requires a lot of light to grow. So they are seeing a major boom in energy consumption. So all of these things happening, other policies, growth, needing energy, and all these different aspects of our life make it challenging to be good managers of how we use energy. But we can choose that. We can, in fact, choose to be efficient in how we use energy, to make good decisions about the timing of when we use energy. In fact, timing matters. There are times, for example, in your home when you're using electricity that it has more impact on the system than it will at other times of the day. Most people get home around 5 o'clock at night. As I mentioned, you like to turn your lights on when you get home. Let's say it's dark at 5, or you turn your TV on because you've got to watch a University of Utah football game, right? I do. And all of those people do it at the same time. What do you think happens on the system? Everybody expects it to be available. And if the system's planned for and operated correctly, it's going to be available. So we have to think about when we use energy and how we use energy if, in fact, we truly want to be more efficient. But I, I have to say that none of this matters. None of this matters if, in fact, we don't have energy available in the first place. The 50 poorest nations have no access to electricity. And the total number of individuals around the globe without electric power today is about 1.5 billion people. And this is currently a quarter of the world's population. And this quarter of the world's population tends to be concentrated mostly in Africa and also in Southern Asia. Asia. And these are places that we know tend to be subject to more violence and more inequality. I used to work with former Lieutenant Governor Bell who once told me, I recognize that bad things, mostly bad things, happen when the lights are out. I'll let you think about what the good things are. So, the amount of electricity consumed in one day in all sub-Saharan Africa, if you take out South Africa, is about equal to the amount of energy that is consumed in New York City. Pretty crazy. So there is a huge gap in electricity usage in the world, but we don't really talk that much about this gap. We don't really think about it. Why? Because energy is remote and because we are surrounded by the water by the energy, we feel safe. But when energy isn't available, even domestically, we feel frustrated, we feel angry, and we look for someone to blame. We look to some entity to say, you failed to provide me with that. You failed to make sure the proper policies were in place. So that, I think, relates to the fact that energy is complicated, it's remote, and we want it to be available. It makes our modern life possible. What we see today in terms of our technological society, I'll call it, is here because of energy. It's the internet, it's your smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, I'll be surprised. It's even Uber. So all of the things that we enjoy today in our technological society is brought about because of energy. So back to my point, no matter what the price of energy, we're going to continue to expect it to be available, and it's going to be vital to our health and welfare, not just to us, but also to other nations. So this takes me to the fourth thing that I've learned about energy. It's complicated. It's remote. We all want it to be available. I think generally I would expect most people could agree on that, but that isn't necessarily the case. Energy is subject to conflicting opinion. I am rarely in a conversation or at a party where I say, someone says, what do you do? And I say, I work in energy. And they say to me, what do you think about fracking? 
What do you think about global warming? What are we going to do about that in the energy space? And everybody will have a different opinion about what that looks like. Well, as I mentioned before, there is an energy ecosystem. Energy, whether it's electricity, natural gas, or liquid fuels, are really fundamental to driving our economy. There is no economy. There is no economy without energy. And if there is, I don't know that it's the kind of economy that most people want to live in. Energy production itself is a source of opportunity. I'm just going to use Utah as an example. In Utah, energy is about a $21 billion business. It's about $15 billion directly. And if you include what economists, which I happen to be, indirect and induced values, it's $21 billion. It provides $656 million in state and local revenues, so very important to communities, including another $77 million that goes directly to educating K through 12 and to some of our institutions through our Utah School and Institutional Trust lands. There are more than 10,000 direct jobs associated with energy in the state and almost 40,000 jobs in energy if you include the indirect and induced employment. Over 98% of the energy produced in Utah, though, currently is oil, gas, and coal. So we recognize, though, that we can diversify. Remember, I said we can make choices. And so right now, the state of Utah is seeing the largest national boom in solar, and I mean large-scale solar production of any state in the country. So we can make choices in what we do in the energy space. And where we are today isn't necessarily where we have to be. There is going to be, though I believe, a continued tension between our energy production and needs and our environmental objectives. And this is very, very real. And we need both of these things, as I've said, because it helps to improve our life. But there are environmental considerations. So I want to just give one example, because I do believe that we can achieve our goals of an ever-improving environment and an ever-growing economy in tandem. But we're going to have to continually find and find again solutions. And we're going to have to be strategic and balanced in how we deal with that tension. Now, I, I want to stop for one second and say by balanced, I don't mean that we're going to sacrifice the environment for energy. What I mean is that we're going to put ourselves in a position where we make decisions that allow us to recognize environmental improvements and sustainability at the same time that we can meet our energy goals. So to my example, air quality along the Wasatch Front. That's a local issue that I think that most people can relate to. We're very concerned about this. We are concerned about the emissions that we are experiencing today. Well, a couple of decades ago, people weren't as concerned about that. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. But they were pushing towards economic growth along the Wasatch Front. Populations were locating along the Wasatch Front. And more importantly, we didn't really understand where all of these emissions came from, and we didn't understand the chemical interactions. And so what's happened and what will continue to happen is that our understanding of the sources of emissions, so where they come from, is it a point source, is it a local place, or is it area source emissions like our buildings and our cars? And how do those emissions come together to cause challenges for us? And as we make decisions in our energy space that help to improve our emissions, we're going to continually have to think about those dynamics as we better understand the various impacts of these emission options and the dynamics that are in play, and I would say in flux, as we look to address those emissions issues. And let's not forget that, in fact, there are a number of technological innovations that can come about to address those issues. For example, we can increase our use of zero-emitting cars, zero-emitting transportation. That will help to reduce our emissions. But if we want to look at some other opportunities, we can look at our thermal power plants, which are predominantly coal in, the U in Utah. And we can say, well, there are technologies that they can deploy and have deployed called selectic, selective catalytic reduction technologies that will improve their emissions profiles. Back to the Wasatch Front, 
We can advance our use of alternative fuels like tier three fuel, fuels, which you may have heard about lately. And we can also transition to being a more localized economy where perhaps we use more active transportation like walking or bike riding, bike lanes. So my point really is that these issues are not now and they never have been black and white. And if these issues are not black and white, then I don't think that the solutions are going to be either. There's going to be constantly changing dynamics. We're gonna see new research that emer emerges. Interpretation of impacts are going to change. Innovative technologies are gonna come along. And we're also gonna see changing regulatory regimes. But I do believe that it is our role, it is our role, to come together to find the best achievable options that can both sustain growth in our economy at the same time that we preserve and improve our environment. So just quickly to wrap up, I, I think maybe you'll agree that energy is in fact complicated and so simple assessments likely are not accurate. But it's also an opportunity to look at what drives the quality of life that we live to look towards how we can be rational in finding solutions. And I believe that we can be the voice of change. It certainly is why I do what I do and why I'm passionate about what I do, because I recognize that energy is a privilege and it is at the core of what makes life better. So my message is about energy. It's about leadership. It's about listening because this is a dialogue. And dialogues take a long time, don't forget. It's about innovation and it's about focus. And for me, it's about the end game. And the end game is to really have the lights on for everyone. So thank you. Do, do I have time for questions or? Absolutely, we have about 14 minutes. Oh darn, so I thought I, no, no, I'm happy to take questions. Do you mind if I throw one at you at the moment? <laughs> Uh, go right ahead. Okay, so I'm prefacing this question with the understanding that from my perspective, it seems we have a really huge national capacity to forget severe mistakes that we make in, in crisis situations. So for example, um, in Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy, a lot of the generators and hospitals were located on the basement level, which were flooded. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, what are your recommendations for how um, local, like micro level power plants um, can prepare for national, or excuse me, natural disasters? That, you know, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I think that the key, and this is the thing that I, I always go to, whether we're talking about affordability or we're talking about resiliency, I think your question is really about resiliency. How can we be sure in the face of an emergency situation that we're gonna be able to have access to some energy? That's how critical it is that you come up with that question because in an emergency, what's the thing you need to make sure? As I mentioned, hospitals, the lights stay on. The key is diversity. We have to be very, very careful about picking winners and losers. It is about having multiple resource options available to us. I think, I think that is, may sound like a very simple answer, but I think that's the answer. Hi, thank you for coming to speak to us. My name is Austin, I'm here in the political science department. Um, what percentage, um, maybe you're not able to give a percentage, but what, what is the amount of energy that is produced in Utah that goes out of state? Because I know quite a bit of the energy goes to California, or am I incorrect in that? Um, we are a net exporter of energy, you are correct. Um, and I want to say that that number is in the ballpark of about 30% um, in terms of our energy exports. And the largest portion of that is um, production from a large coal-fired facility located in Delta, Utah, about 1,900 megawatts, that is exported for California's use. Hi, my name is Zena. Um, I'm studying international politics and sustainability. Um, you mentioned that Utah is currently experiencing the largest national boom in solar development, which I've definitely seen evidence of. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, what you have to say about the fact that a lot of people are still pushing for fracking and um, you know natural gas and oil uh, development as a source of jobs 
uh, where that is obviously mostly short term um, and solar can be long term. Why is that not brought up? Um, good, good question. And um, I, I'm going to, um, again, as I have attempted to be here through all my comments today, very objective. And um, I'm going to say, because a couple of subjective things and, you know, what's short term versus long term, I think those are questions that we could spend a lot of time talking about. But I, I really think it comes back to this, the two key things. One is diversity. And we have different resources that are available in different places. Utah is a natural resource rich state. We have solar, we have wind, we have geothermal, we have coal, we have natural gas, we have hydro even. We have a number of micro hydro systems in the state. And so given the location, and given the opportunities, people are going to make choices to develop different resources. And they're going to have different indications for their economy. And that diversity, as I mentioned, I think also provides resiliency to our overall energy system. So I think, you know, the, those two key things, kind of the, the economics locally, based on where the resource is, and the diversity really are key to how those decisions get made. But the other thing is that some resources aren't available all the time. And so we continue to look for those opportunities that allow us to have backup power when those other fuels might not be available. So as we move towards more solar, as I mentioned before, we can look for new opportunities like maybe offsetting that with large wind resources, but it takes time. That gets back to my dialogue comment. It is a dialogue and it takes a long time. <laughs> Thanks, Zena and Austin, for your questions so far. Hi, my name is Tyler. I'm double majoring in urban ecology and environmental sustainability studies. And uh, I just have a question about what you meant when you said that um, the homes in California have like a glut of solar energy. Like I'm from California, and I think we need as much energy as we can considering how like populated the state is. So like how can we have too much solar? I don't know. I just didn't really understand that. that that's a, another um, terrific question, and um, we could deliver a whole course, and I have attended conferences that have attempted to go over this. The short answer is that the sun shines uh, at the time that they don't need the energy. So they have a lot of solar panels that are producing energy when the sun is shining, and then they don't have energy when they need it. And when they have too much energy, because you're not at home, right, you're not running your dryer, um, you don't have your smartphone plugged in, you're not on your computer, you don't have your electric car plugged in, right? Um, there's a lot of energy produced and they just, they don't need it. So they have to back down generation uh, and then they have to ramp up that other generation later in the day when they do need it. So I'll give you the short answer, which is it is very much a timing issue about when that energy is available. But there's a more complicated answer because remember this is all very complicated. I have another question. I was wondering how on a daily basis, since you have worked for the government, you have to approach things extremely neutrally and objectively like you have been doing, um, which is extremely respectable. So how do you bridge that communication gap between people who want to you know, get into the really crazy um, but valid moral arguments and then between the technical aspect? How do you approach that on a daily basis? Um, I don't know if I'm exactly going to answer your question, but um, maybe I'll just tell you a little bit about who I am. I started out working in the energy space with a focus on consumers. I really consider myself to be a consumer advocate and fundamentally believing that um, all people deserve an opportunity to have a certain quality of life. I, I'm not, not saying that we give it to them, but they have the opportunity to have it and that having access to energy is critical to having that opportunity. If you've been to places where the lights aren't on, it can be very challenging. I mean, why do, why do scary movies happen in the dark? Because people are afraid of the dark. And we do like to have light because it allows us to do all these other things, but if it's so expensive and so cost prohibitive, the inequalities that can occur because of that, I think, are something that we need to address as a society. So from my perspective, it is about having all energy options so that we have a resilient, affordable, reliable, 
source of energy for everyone. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's how I come at it from my, from what I would call my moral center. Hi, Laura. Uh, my name is Chris Romano. Thanks for visiting today. Um, I was wondering if you believe that renewable resor uh, renewable sources of energy will have to uh, achieve grid parity before our state makes a commitment to um, producing a large majority of our energy from renewable resources. Um, so. Uh, I think you've hit on something really important is, you know, a lot of times these, we're thinking about these environmental imperatives and certain social goals that we have, but the economics, you're right, always comes into play. What are the costs of these resources? Well, innovation is, is critical to all of this, and we are seeing significant technological innovation today. Um, the cost of solar has dec declined substantially. It's not on par yet with other resources, but we're certainly seeing it come down. Um, and I also think that people want to see more solar, and so there is some social pressure. And I will also note that the state does offer tax incentives for um, alternative energy development, which include um, solar and geothermal options, just to name a couple. And the significant increase that we're seeing in what I'll call utility scale solar, particularly in the southwest part of the state, um, we're going to go from roughly 5% renewable energy, and that includes all of our renewable sources today. I've got micro hydro in there, um, our wind resources, and even our existing solar from 5% to 15%. Now, if you think about, well, 5 to 15%, but that's a 10% increase over where we are today. So I think that we're seeing the move towards increased uh, solar production in the state today, whether it's utility scale or it's residential or commercial solar. And the state hasn't be moved away from the tax incentives that it offers currently for those resources as we look to be a little bit disruptive in building a more resilient energy economy. Uh, my name is Garrett. I'm a double major in chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, I was wondering, kind of on that same note, as far as exploration and innovation goes, um, has there been any progress on the shell, on the shell oil found in Utah, on the border of Utah and Colorado? Um, there are a lot of companies that are working to develop oil shale uh, in the state of Utah, and this is different from shale oil, which is predominantly produced from the fracking and horizontal drilling and other technological innovations where you have actually pockets of what we would consider conventional oil, but um, you kind of need to pull them together and aggregate them. Oil shale is really a premature uh, oil. Um, it's a kerogen biologic content that can be converted into oil by heating it up. Um, there are um, a number of companies that are working on developing that. Uh, one company is a, a local company, Redleaf Resources, that's developed their own technology. Another one is Inifet American Oil um, that has been producing, is, is the subsidiary of, a, of a, a company in Estonia that has been using oil shell predominantly for power production for about 100 years. And they also use it to produce some bunker fuel. And they're working on their environmental programs um, today. So I think we're seeing some movement. I think we see people looking at how we could use that fuel. And I think um, whether we do or not, I, I think remains to be seen. But defining it as a resource has some consequences in terms of how the U.S. is positioned in terms of its oil resources. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. If no one else, thank you very much. This concludes the formal broadcast of our Hinckley Forum today. Thank you very much to Dr. Lauren Nelson. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.